All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining my live for, what is this, Friday the 23rd of February or Thursday the 22nd of February, depending on what part of the world you're in. Um, so thank you all very much. It's nice to see everybody. Okay. So, um, yes, yeah, so we'll get started with some questions. First is from Albino Rhino. <laughs> Uh, is there anything wrong with eating smoked meat on a carnivore diet, pellet smoker, charcoal, etc.? Um, certainly, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing it uh, occasionally. And um, probably not even all that much wrong with it doing it more often than that. You know, we've been we've been cooking with fire for at least 800,000 years, possibly more, probably more. Um, because there's evidence some people who are using ovens 800,000 years ago. And... So, you know, we're going to get a lot of smoke in our food. Now, is that the same as, as having something in a smoker? No, it's not. Um, but I don't think there's a problem with, you know, sort of cooking and having that sort of open fire sort of cook. Um, so I don't I don't think that um, there's much of an issue having smoked meats, at least, uh, you know, on the on an occasion. And I still think it's better than any of the alternatives. Um probably best not to make it the only thing that you eat um, just uh, just because you don't want to build up of, of these different sorts of products but you know the the, the issues with with um, cooked meat anyway or the, the little burnt particulates you know the studies looking at that were pretty weak and so you know I don't I don't know if we can really go uh, go off much of those as well but you know uh, I wouldn't make it as a mainstay, but every now and then I'd, I'd say it's fine. Bruce Lynch, thank you for the super chat. Is MCT oil okay and healthy on carnivore? Also, does does any animal fats cross the blood-brain barrier? If so, how does that work? Been on carnivore a month. Um, so as far as MCT oil, that's generally derived from coconut oil and... I don't think there's necessarily, well, I don't know of any problem specifically with MCT oil. If you're getting it from coconut oil, um, it may have the plant sterols, which are the plant's cholesterol, which mimic our cholesterol. They're close enough to our cholesterol that the, that it, that our body stops making enough of our own cholesterol. And then we don't have enough substrate for our hormones, for vitamin D, for our cell membranes, for bile for our brains, things like that. Um, potentially brains, you know, the, it's thought that cholesterol doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. So the brain makes its own cholesterol. Now the brain definitely does make its own cholesterol, but there are studies showing, um, biochemical pathways that could potentially have cholesterol crossing the blood brain barrier. And there seems to be evidence that there is, and it sort of breaks down into smaller molecules, crosses the barrier and then reconstitutes into cholesterol. <laughs> Um, in and out of the brain. So, um, so I've certainly seen studies like that, that, that suggest that this process is happening and things are crossing in and out. So I don't know how plant sterols affect that in the brain anyway, but, um, in any case, you know, I, I have no idea if these plant sterols are getting in the MCT oil and that's the, that's what I, that's what I worry about. And so it's just, you know, I mean, there, there are MCTs in, in uh, animal fats as well. It's not like you don't get them, um, but you just don't get the plant sterols as well. So that's, I think that's the main thing with anything plant derived. Um, even if it's, even if it's like an MCT oil, it's not omega sixes and linoleic acid and all that sort of stuff um, is that it's, it's, um, it's uh, you know, it's got plant sterols also, you know, anything at room temperature, uh, anything liquid at room temperature is going to be a bit less stable. And so it's out, it, it can, you know, because these things are going to be unsaturated, so they can break down into into other problems, um, you know, oxidize and things like that. Uh, as to animal fats crossing the blood brain barrier, it depends on the fat. Like I just said, there is there is a proposed mechanism for cholesterol crossing the blood brain barrier. Ketones cross the blood brain barrier, and ketones can reconstitute into fatty acids and be used as as the building blocks of materials. Um, things like DHA, EPA, those those get into the brain as well because the brain's largely made from DHA and EPA. Um, about 20% is made out of DHA. 
And uh, a lot of it's from cholesterol as well, although a lot of that is manufactured in the brain as well. So because DHA isn't, we don't make enough of it, we have to get that in our diet, then obviously it ha would, if it's being used to make a large portion of our brain, it's required to make a large portion of our brain from our dietary DHA, then it would have to get into the brain. I don't know the exact mechanism. Um, I've also spoken to doctors and researchers uh, such as Dr. Georgia Ede, who talks about how you really don't want to have any linoleic acid in your diet at all, or if you do very little, that's one of the omega-6s uh, that is very common in uh, plant fats, plant oils. And that's not the one we need. We need arachidonic acid, but that comes from meat. ALA, or sorry, linoleic acid, LA can be turned into arachidonic acid, but you don't need it to turn it to arachidonic acid unless you're just getting no arachidonic acid from your meat. So LA is... Um, is really unstable, it oxidizes very quickly, it sends off free radicals, and can actually get in your brain. Your brain can't really use it as a structural component, doesn't really know what to do with it, so it starts breaking it down for energy, and it's and it's a very inefficient energy and starts causing a lot of oxidative stress, um, according to Dr. Ede. And so she was saying that from a mental health point of view, that this stuff was really, really damaging to the brain, and so uh, not to use it. But yeah, so fats can get into the brain. Uh, certainly cholesterol seems to be able to, we know ketones can and reconstitute into fatty acids and, um, and then the, the omega threes because they're used to build the brain. So, uh, yeah, I don't know all the mechanisms for those though, but, uh, that they definitely are some that can. Amber, thank you for the super chat. What do you think about fat protein when doing, uh, when trying to build muscle and strength? Uh, not looking to be a bodybuilder, just uh, really good strength. Uh, so I think it's the same same for anybody in any other situation. You need enough fat. You need enough protein, right? So you need to have enough, uh, you know, enough of all these essential nutrients. So fat isn't just a calorie source. It's there are essential fatty acids that you have to have, or you won't be as healthy as you can be, and you could potentially get very sick or die. There. Are, essential fat soluble nutrients that you have to have, or you not going to be as healthy as you could be, and you could get sick or die. So it's very important to get enough of both. And so you just eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. You try to get as much fat as your body's asking you for so that you're not constipated. Your body has a limited capacity to absorb fat. And then you have a spillover mechanism. You, you have bile and that allows you to absorb fat. After that, it's very small percentage can actually, can actually, um, uh, absorb, you know, absorb in your gut without bile. So the rest of it goes out. And so, you know, people say, oh, you don't want to eat too much fat. I mean, that that's just a holdover to vilification of fat. I, I really don't think that you can overeat fat or overabsorb fat uh, physiologically because you just, you're just not going to absorb it. And if you take a bunch of box bile, I'm sure, yeah, you'll absorb too much fat. So don't do that. Right. Um, but when you're talking about just being healthy and whether that's building muscle or, or just, sitting on your ass. It's just, you want to eat enough as much uh, fatty meat as your body's asking you for. And so if you do that, your body will tell you, your body will tell you how much meat to get, how much fat to get, how much protein to get. And you just go by taste. And so when I'm working out, if I want to put on muscle, I need to make sure I'm eating enough. If, normally I just eat once a day, one big steak a day. And that's fine for me. If I'm, I'm lifting weights, I'll, I'll probably be hungry for, for that sort of level of a meal twice a day, not once a day. And, and so that, and that's when I, I see really good muscle growth. If I'm just still eating the same amount, like I'll get more toned, I'll get more defined, I'll uh, get a bit leaner and more cut and I'll feel better and I'll get stronger, but I won't, I won't put on the mass unless I eat more food. Very simple. You know, you need these, you need these atoms to build up the structures in your body and your muscles. So that's it really just, um, just eat enough and work out and you should be fine. So I saw a question here on Instagram from Asai Touchly. I don't know. I hope that's somewhat right. So then I know who I'm talking about. It says, hi, Anthony, what recommendations you have for someone with gastroparesis? So this is, this is a, uh, this is an important one because when gastroparesis is when you, you, your, your stomach isn't going to be pushing and moving and, 
opening up and moving things through properly. It's just sort of a bit more static uh, paresis. It's paralyzed, right? That's sort of what the name suggests. And so it's not um, as as easy to eat large meals and it doesn't, and it takes longer to digest and, and move this through. And so what you need to do is don't drink water around mealtime, first and foremost, because you want all that space available for food. And so you eat fatty meat again and just until you're comfortably full or until it stops tasting good. Um, it could be that you're going to need to eat multiple times a day just to get enough food in um, because of how your stomach's working and, uh, and, and not really working properly. And, uh, and that's it. So just, just eat fatty meat until you're full or it stops tasting good. Um, and then do that as many times as during the day as tastes good to you to meet your, your biological demands and then drink water outside of that. I'd give it, I'd, I'd probably not drink water for at least, you know, an hour or two before you eat a large meal, probably two hours if you're, if you're, if you can. And, um, and then just space it out. Hopefully this is something that is transient and by getting proper nutrition, your body can heal a bit and, and move this on. But that is how I would deal with it. Um, if not. Okay. Sunshine kiss. Thank you for the super chat. Nathan Bryan states, we need nitrates, leafy veggies to boost nitric oxide, expand blood vessels, lower BP, uh, how to get nitrates on, on a carnivore diet. So, I mean, okay. I mean, that, that's, that's nice that he says that, but I mean, what evidence does he have that we have to get it from leafy greens? Breathe through your nose and you'll, you'll produce more nitric oxide. Go into the sun and get UVA light on your skin and you'll produce more nitric oxide. And why would it be that for millions of years we've been eating meat and during the ice ages we had no leafy green vegetables available uh, really for most people and they were just eating meat and animals and things like that and yet, you know, seemed to have the right amount of nitric oxide for whatever the hell we were doing and, um, you know, so, well, maybe it wasn't optimal. Well, maybe it wasn't optimal, but it's really hard to get through an ice age when you're, when you're not optimal. Um, because you, you can't just barely make it through an ice age, right? You either thrive or you die, you go extinct. I mean, there's, there's, there's no two options there. There's, there's extremely harsh conditions and, you know, death is around the corner for everybody at all times. So if you're just sort of barely making it, you're not making it. And so if you were deficient in nitric oxide, it's not going to happen. And think about it this way. When you're up in the Arctic Circle, the Inuit, they're not getting a lot of UV light either. Um, UVA is more penetrative. It can get through the atmosphere a bit better. But the, but the angles of the, of, of the sun are so oblique that the barely any rays are getting there. And this is, is above the tree line. A lot of these people are above the tree line. But what, what that is, is it's a certain latitude that above that, the angle of the sun is so oblique that trees cannot grow. And get little shrubs and bushes and then nothing no plant life can grow even if it was even if it were in the summer and not horribly uh cold and harsh and and um and uh, impossible to grow anyway so you know they're not getting nitric oxide from from the sun you know presumably they're breathing through their nose at some point most animals breathe through their nose we seem to be a bunch of mouth breathers but uh, you shouldn't be. You should breathe through your nose. And um, and and who's to say we're not getting this from meat? Who's to say that we're not getting this in the exact right proportions from what we're eating? And also, you know, if you're taking something, you know, with with leafy greens, you're getting everything else that comes with leafy greens. So you're getting something from. I mean, this is this is the cherry picking the things that you want from from this and then just leaving the rest, you know? So, I mean, leafy greens have toxins, they have defense chemicals. So do those, do, does the nitric oxide outweigh those defense chemicals? Most green leaves, leafy greens uh, will kill you, you know, like hemlock, that'll kill you. And so, you know, it's, it is absolutely not, um, you know, it, it, it is you know, not, proven by any stretch of the imagination that you have to have leafy green vegetables to get nitric acid, uh, nitric oxide or anything else 
Um, and so this is just supposition on his part or just say, oh, you have to have it. And so maybe this is a good thing. Maybe say he's arguing that you should eat these because you get more nitric oxide. Well, do you? I don't know. You know, has anyone compared that? Has anyone compared, you know, the Inuit only eating their natural diet of meat and, you know, someone who eats a whole bunch of kale, you know, have they, have they studied that? Have they said, well, yes, these people have more nitric oxide than the other person. And does that matter? Does that make a difference in their health outcomes? So, you know, a lot of these things are assuming a fact that's not in evidence. They're making a statement saying you need nitric oxide and, and a best source of acid as leafy green vegetables. Well, who says that we are deficient in nitric oxide? Where does, where does it say that? You know, we're deficient in B12 as a as a people, as a population. We can see that because the reference ranges for B12 are getting lower and lower and lower because those are averages for the community. So we can see that more and more people are getting deficient um, and uh, getting lowering our, our testosterone and estrogen levels. Infertility is, is through the roof. You know, so there's a lot of problems that we're having. Um, haven't heard it uh, that nitric oxide was the main driver of all that um testosterone levels are like in the 2000s and 25 year old and, and men in their 20s had half the testosterone levels of the average man in uh the 70s right or, or, or who was in their 60s in 1970s right so you know testosterone levels have just come right down and it's worse now so testosterone levels are in the tank nutritional levels are in the tank nutrient levels are in the tank um uh, infertility is sky high. Um, Non-communicable diseases is are the number one killer in the world. And about eighty percent of issues that that doctors treat now are non-communicable diseases. These so-called chronic diseases that didn't exist in any large number before the twentieth century it must have been because of all you know lack of nitric oxide, I guess. So Jim Waddell, thank you for the super chat. Can you talk about brown fat? Where is it on the body and how cold skin uh, activates the burning of it? Thanks. Um, I don't think it's it's about uh, burning of the brown fat. That's that's the issue. The brown fat has a, a lot of mitochondria in it, and that's why it looks brown. Uh, babies have a lot of brown fat, and this is what keeps them warm. So they, the mitochondria are just generating a lot of energy as heat energy in order to stay warm and keep the baby warm so it doesn't die and um and we have brown fat as well and so when you're going to a cold plunge or you get cold as hell and your body starts shivering and all that sort of stuff you're, you'll stimulate your brown fat and the mitochondria in there to start producing heat to keep you alive and keep you from freezing to death and um I'm not an expert in that. I think that um, there is some inter interesting research out there, and I've seen some interesting um, talks by different people. And uh, Ben Bickman talks about uh, the brown fat as well, how this can actually stimulate more thyroid uh, hormone production. Um, so if you get really cold and you're like shivering, this can cause your your thyroid production to ramp up by like fifty percent. And so obviously that's again you're increasing your metabolism and trying to burn more energy so that you you stay warm and you survive this cold attack so that's that's basically as much as i know about brown fat um uh, but ben bickman has a lot of things on it as well and he's a you know professor from biochemistry at byu so um you know he's got a lot of a lot of uh you know very interesting things uh, to do with uh, just metabolism and how that works. And this this would be part of that. So Karen, uh, Caitlin, thank you so much for the super chat. I'm not seeing a question along with it, but maybe, maybe down the chain. We'll take a look. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm just going to take a look here. Oh, goodness. Okay. Bloom, thank you very much for the super chat. It's very kind of you. Um, they say parents think that strict carnivore is bad. Father in his late sixties is too skinny. It's on statins. Thoughts on that effects on the brain keto for him. If he won't do carnivore question mark, how much fat intake he needs more muscle and healthy body weight. Yeah. Look, if the, if, um, 
it's understandable. I mean, this goes against a lot of people, what people have been saying for the last sort of 50 years. However, it goes exactly in accordance with what doctors and researchers have been saying for thousands and thousands of years. The meat's very important. It's very healthy. It's very, it's very critical to have for optimal health and longevity. And, um, and we did not have the chronic diseases and Alzheimer's that we've had uh, previously or that, that we've had uh, recently. So, and it, oh, wow, people just didn't live long enough. Stupid, stupid statement. Uh, of course we did. Uh, Socrates was 76 when he was, when he was terrorizing Athens with his intellect 2,500 years ago or so. Um, when they killed him with a plant, by the way, they made him drink hemlock. And, um, and so, you know, wh where was his Alzheimer's? You know, and there wasn't, there was nothing in, you know, in Plato or anybody's writing. It was just like, oh my God, he was just the oldest guy in the world. I mean, oh, this is amazing. I mean, we had PhD programs, you know, going back how many hundreds of years? I mean, it's just, just a thousand years, you know, and you have, uh, you know, people that were, you know, finishing their education <coughs> in their late twenties and then going on in their career. And they only lived 10 more years after that. Pretty foolish to, to waste your time getting a PhD, an advanced degree and going in academia. If you're just going to just like work your ass off and then die 10 years later. I mean, this is stupid. Um, you know, just look at, look at the ages of the founding fathers of America and when they died. My great grandfather was born in 1875. He died in 1975 at home, fully compass mentis. Um, this is stupid. So Alzheimer's was first described at a, it was a, it was a one-off case report from Dr. Hall, Alzheimer's that he presented at a conference in 1906. And it was brand new. No one had ever seen this before. That's why he presented this. Wow, wow, look at this weird new case. And and then it got coined Alzheimer's dementia. And now it's ex extremely prevalent and deaths from Alzheimer's is, is on the rise, even when adjusting for age. So no, this isn't, this isn't something that's been going on forever and we just didn't notice it or people weren't living long enough to get it. Um, that's foolish. That's someone who's never looked at the statistics, never looked at the modal age. It's the difference between average life expectancy from birth and modal age. Modal age is how, how, you know, what's the average age that people actually die at? How old do people get to if they die of, you know, of old age? Those are different things than, you know, how long people live if they, if they don't get killed by something is, and, and modal age, how long people tend to live um, when they live to adulthood and average life expectancy from birth, very different things. You know, infant mortality was like three out of five, right? So, you know, it, you had to have those other two people living a very long time. A lot of people died in wars and famines in early age. And, and so that basically that one in five had to live a hell of a lot longer just to pull that average up to 36, 38. Um, and I think it was 38. Uh, average life expectancy from birth was 38 in, in 1850. But if you lived to 10 years old, it was 60. And if you lived to 20, it was longer. And you lived to 30, it was longer, right? So if you if you got through those kill points in early age, people lived a very long time, right? So no, that's ridiculous. But um, keto has been shown. Keto is the most studied diet ever. And um as uh, Rob, uh, Dr. Rob Sivas said uh, in our interview the other day, so that'll be coming out in the next couple of weeks. Really interesting guy. Um, and uh, he was saying, you know, I sort of mentioned that. And he was just like, it's the only diet that's been studied because the other diets are just, you know, have a, have a questionnaire. You know, you get the nurses study and you give, them a, you give them a questionnaire once a year and you say, hey, what did you eat in the last year? How the hell would you know that with any accuracy? You know, I mean, it's, it's just ridiculous. And, and so that's, the, that's the quality of data on these other diets. Ketogenic diets have randomized controlled trials in large numbers with multiple health outpoint, outcomes and endpoints by the thousands, right? So this is, this is really the only really well-studied diet, it's certainly the most rigorously studied diet ever. And those studies have shown that a keto, high fat meat based ketogenic diet is a better treatment for Alzheimer's than every medication for Alzheimer's ever trialed. 
That's what the studies have shown. Um, people are reversing Alzheimer's. And if you're going to reverse it, you can certainly prevent it uh, by going on ketogenic diets, like a carnivore diet. It doesn't even necessarily have to be carnivore, but you just need to eat more meat, more fat. That's what your brain is made out of, like we were talking about before. And you go in, you're in ketosis, so your brain is getting ketones. It's running on its optimal fuel source. It's getting ketones in there to reconstruct into fatty acids and rebuild the structures of the brain. And you're getting nutrients like B12 that are integral for, for myelination of your axons, which will actually give bulk to your brain. Um, and uh, there was a study in 2008 out of Oxford that looked at, um, you know, part of it was looking at vegans. They followed them for five years, looked them on MRI and found that their brain shrank by 5% volume. And they thought this was likely due to their critically low B12, which was 180, 190. And that's, that's, that's in the normal ranges now, uh, for B12, because again, we're just so deficient. Just people are going, oh, plant-based. Everyone's plant-based. People don't realize, oh, you need to go plant-based. You're already plant-based. The average, the average Western diet is plant-based. It's like 70, 80% plants, right? And so, you know, it's just processed plants. There's barely any meat in there. It's not the meat that's doing that. It's all the other plants and garbage that they're putting in it. Seed oils, sugars, all this crap. And, um, you know, so that's, that's, that's what the problem is. Um, so being on statins, statins, you know, why do we need to be on statins to lower LDL? Okay, well, is LDL actually a problem? I don't think it is. I think the evidence is very clear that this was just a scapegoat. There's no serious scientist actually independently said, oh, I, I think I think cholesterol is a really big problem here. It was the sugar companies who came up with that. And then they found people like Ansel Keys and other, other uh, professors, three from Harvard in particular, one became the head of the USDA, who they could buy off and say, hey, you need to push this. We want we want to get this out there that cholesterol causes heart disease. And they're like, sure, my my integrity is non-existent. I'll, I'll be happy to. And um, and so they they did that. And um, and we we know they did that because we have their contracts. We have the internal memos from the sugar companies saying that they did this. And so, you know, this is this is a matter of record. It's not a it's not a conjecture. It's not up for debate. You don't need a study or a flyer or a survey from nurses once a year to figure that out. We have this documented. This is this is a known entity. And so uh, L cholesterol was never the problem. You know, and they keep shifting the goalposts. They said, oh, total cholesterol, that's the problem. And then you have all these different kinds of cholesterol. And like, OK, there's good cholesterol and there's bad cholesterol. And that didn't really work out either. There's a hundred different kinds of cholesterol, LDL cholesterol. And, oh, okay. Well, maybe this one, maybe that one. No, no, no. They're all bad. And oh, maybe this. And and now they're like, okay, well, that's not really holding up either because people with higher cholesterol, LDL cholesterol of any description live longer. I'm like, ooh, okay. And there's inverse correlations in some studies with total cholesterol and cardiovascular death, like the Framingham study. That's what they, their actual data showed, but it was misreported by the AHA, American Heart Association, who was being paid off by the sugar companies to lie and say that it was the opposite and that higher cholesterol, higher cardiovascular mortality rate. In fact, it was the opposite, lower total cholesterol, higher cardiovascular mortality rate. Um, and so they went, oh, okay, well, that's not, well, now it's ApoB. Oh, ApoB, oh my God. It's just, they're just, they're just banging the same drum. And every time you just show how full of shit they are, they just, they just move to the next thing, move to the next thing. You know, it's just classic misdirection. They're just trying to, it's just red herrings. They're just trying to keep you looking over here. Don't mind the man behind the curtain. Just look over here. Look over here. Uh, it's nonsense. And and the sooner we just get away from this and just say, look, it's bullshit. It was always bullshit. It's bullshit now. We're not talking about it. The sooner this goes away, if we keep just playing this game and keep and they keep saying, well, but it's this, well, but it's this, well, but it's this, we're never going to get anywhere. Right. So we just stopped talking to these people about it. The first heart attack in America, first death by heart attack on autopsy in America was in 1912. First all, case of Alzheimer's was 1906. Right. So where was this before that? Oh, we just didn't notice before that. Bullshit. Doctors were doing thousands of autopsies and dissections over their career. And you had thousands of people doing thousands of autopsies in you know, any given country and more in some countries that were bigger. And uh, not a single damn thing in the literature before 1912, except for one obscure reference. And uh, somebody tried to say this, like, oh, well, 
you know, there's this reference here in the late 1700s and they presented at a conference saying that, oh, wow, isn't this weird? We saw this thrombus in the in the coronary vessels. Like, hmm, isn't, isn't that strange? We've never seen that before. And they're like, that's your proof that this was happening all the time, that this is the number one killer in the world by this one obscure reference 130 years before it's ever seen again. Great job, buddy. And um, so, you know, you, you have to deal with less than intelligent people when you when you talk about these things because they're just trying to defend an ideology. They, they're convinced of something because they're, they think that they're smart. They're the smartest person that they know and that they say, oh, well, if I think it, it must be true. Um, and so they're just desperately trying to defend why they are not wrong. Uh, so again, 130 years, absolutely zero heart attacks. We're eating more meat and fat in the 1800s than we're in the early 1900s when this became the number one killer in America. First heart attack, first death by heart attack, um, proven on autopsy in 1912. 20 years later, it's the number one killer in America. You do the math. This is at the time where we're eating the least amount of meat in 200 years, U-shaped curve. Beginning of the 1800s, a lot of meat, slowly coming down, slowly coming down. It was a big vegetarian push from the puritanicals and the, and the temperance movement uh, because they're saying meat's sinful. It makes you lustful and makes you want to have sex. And oh my gosh, how could we possibly want to procreate and advance the, the human race? And then we get down to the 1920s and 30s. It's at the trough. The lowest point in meat consumption in America, in America for 200 years, that's when it becomes the number one killer in America. And then it sort of comes up from there. Uh, so it's not even associated. There isn't even association with this. So, and and the thing you have to realize too, for the people that you know saw Peter Tia's talk about how familial, familial hypercholesterolemia proves, and you know, all these other things prove that um, LDL is causative. Okay, well, if it were causative. Why is it that the people with familial hypercholesterolemia in the 1800s didn't die of heart attacks? It's not what they died of because there isn't a single case reported in the literature. But if people study population genetics, you'll know that the exact same percentage of genes and alleles that exist in the population stay in that population regardless of time and expansion of, of the population as a whole, uh, unless there's a mass uh, extinction event or a mass migration event. So, but if we're talking world population, or at least in America, at least in Europe, where we can look at these things and check these things, unless we're saying that, you know, just people from third world countries are the ones getting heart attacks and they've moved into different countries and now they started getting picked up, very unlikely. Um, but, you know, in, in these Western countries, you have the exact same amount of people having familial hypercholesterolemia now as then, right? And yet no heart attacks, right? So if high LDL will kill you and your body just makes the the you know the 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 product of its own demise, then you know, why weren't we seeing that before 1912? Why was there just one obscure reference in the late 1700s? People obviously could see it. These were smart people, and they knew the hell they these people did more dissections than any surgeon alive today. Any of them. You know, like an anatomist, maybe, you know, they spend all day in a lab, but that's what these people were doing. They spent all their, most of their days, they're just in the lab doing dissections, doing dissections, then go out and treat some people, you know, deliver some babies, go back in. Uh, that's when Semmelweis uh, actually figured out that there's, you know, uh, microbial infections and things like that, because people were doing dissections on cadavers and doing autopsies. And because that's what people did. And then they'd go and deliver a baby, not wash their hands, go back in and start cutting up dead bodies again. And the infection rate was through the roof on these, on these mothers. So people were always doing dissections. That was a major part of what you did as a doctor in those days in the 1800s. And, um, you know, I mean, these people figured out the, the circulatory system hundreds of years ago with no imaging. Um, you know, they figured out how to calculate the number of atoms of gas in a, in a container before you had any way of measuring it with advanced advanced equipment. And it was right. Right. So, you know, these people were a hell of a lot smarter than most people alive now because they had to be, they didn't have, they couldn't rely on technology, you know, 
And, um, and it's certainly a hell of a lot smarter than anybody who made makes this statement that, oh, they just wouldn't have noticed it because they're stupid. Yeah, Da Vinci, who invented a helicopter hundreds of years ago, is a moron. And even though he did thousands of dissections, I'm sure he just, just wouldn't have noticed a big ass clot in the heart and a big dead chunk of heart muscle. Yeah, just the guy was a moron. You just you just can't trust these people. So pretty just <laughs> on a bit of a tangent there. Um but uh look, statin is like you don't need what do we need those for? Um, you know, to lower lower LDL cholesterol. But why are we lowering LDL cholesterol? It was a con. It was a farce uh, in the first place. I did a um, a video called uh, "The Truth About Cholesterol and Heart Disease," and I, I just go into the the actual studies that completely run counter to that. And so, if people will want to check that out. They can. Um, hopefully, your dad eats more meat, more fat. It's good for him. Um, should really think about you know what he's trying to accomplish with the statins. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't, I'm just, there may be some application outside of, uh, lowering LDL, but you know, that they have, but, um, you don't want to lower LDL, LDL, higher LDL is, um, is associated with longevity and lower all cause mortality in studies with 12 million participants and, uh, total cholesterol was shown in another study with 44,000. Um, you know, out of Sweden last year, that the two most important biomarkers to predict living over 100 was low fasting insulin and high total cholesterol. So why would you want to lower your cholesterol? I, I don't. I think that's exactly what we're supposed to do. Maybe people, you know, people that go on a carnivore diet, ketogenic carnivore diet, say, get this massive elevation of LDL. Oh my gosh, it's up there with people with familial hypercholesterolemia. Or maybe that's not the aberration. Maybe maybe they're protected against eating crappy food and lowering their LDL to a suboptimal state. Maybe we're supposed to be there. Maybe that's a better place to be. And maybe when you eat what you're designed to eat and your body works the way it's designed to work and your cholesterol does that, maybe you should think and say, hey, maybe that's where it's supposed to be. Maybe that's where we're designed to be biologically. Maybe we've been eating meat in this, you know, and sometimes in exclusion for thousands of years during ice ages in the Arctic Circle, or people like the Inuit who stayed up there, you know, they've been eating that way for millennia, and their cholesterol is likely going to be like that. So maybe that's what we're supposed to be. Maybe that's what's normal. Maybe when you eat a bunch of carbs and sugar and crap, and your cholesterol comes down, maybe that's the aberration. Maybe that's bad. And maybe the people with familial hypercholesterolemia are protected from that. And their body says, nope, we're keeping it up here because that's where it's supposed to be. I think that's how you should think about it. You know, you should question these sorts of things. We should we should not just be spoon fed, uh, you know, answers from people that did not that that had their own interests at heart. They're they're protect they're trying to sell something. They're trying to push a product and they're trying to protect their product because their product is toxic to people. And why are we listening to them? Why are we listening to their advice and the advice of the paid shills that um, that they that were bought off by them? Not great. Not great idea. So yeah, keto is certainly better than any than uh, the alternative. If he's not doesn't want to do carnivore, uh, just eat more fat, eat more meat, and you put on muscle. You know, stimulate it. Go for walks. Try to do some exercises and resistance, and should be right. Should be right. And. Tomahawk Skipper um, says chronic kidney failure is carnivore diet contraindicated. No, absolutely not. In fact, higher um, protein intake has been shown to improve kidney function, not make it worse. So that's a myth that needs to die as well. And I've seen quite a lot of people with CKD4, CKD5 uh, improve and, um, and, and go away from the um, you know, potential needs for uh, dialysis and, and uh, renal transplant. Polycystic kidney disease, in fact, has been shown to be benefited by a ketogenic diet, specifically in a series of, of um, papers that have come out recently as well. So no, it is definitely not contraindicated. In fact, like everything else, it's uh, indicated. Uh, any, any issue that you have eating a biologically appropriate diet is indicated, and this is certainly one of them. Jay Smith, 
Um, thank you for the super chat. Male, 68, 5'8", 135 pounds, carnivore for four months. My stools are very little. Now they are large and a lot. I can't seem to gain weight. I eat two ribeyes, two pounds of burger, uh, six eggs daily. Uh, am I not absorbing? Potentially. I mean, it's, um, you know, if you're eating anything else along with them, make sure that you cut those out. Um, just eat until it stops tasting good. That may be enough for you. It may not be. It definitely seems like a lot, but, um, you know, just keep eating until it stops tasting good. If you're having, if you think you're having, uh, digest or absorption issues, um, there may be a reason why that you may have to, you know, get, get checked out by your doctor, infection, other sorts of things, um, medications, um, if you're not eating, if you're eating anything else besides just meat, eggs, and water, get rid of it. And, um, yeah, and just keep eating until it stops tasting good. The gaining weight part, you know, if that's where your body wants you to be, then that's where it wants you to be. You need to stimulate your body to grow in positive ways. So if you want to gain healthy, you know, lean body mass, you need to exercise, you need to do, uh, resistance training to failure, and you need to do sprinting either, you know, on the ground or on a stationary bicycle where you are like an assault bike or something like that, where you crank up the resistance and you just sprint as hard as you can um, for as long as you can, then you, you stop. And so, if, and if you can go longer than a minute, you're not going hard enough. So unless you, in, to, until you get into very good shape. So that's what you need to do. You need to stimulate your body and then you need to eat enough for your body to grow and repair. Could be that you've been under eating and malnourished for a long time and your body's trying to catch up and you're not, you're not gaining weight because your body's just trying to rebuild and repair. But, um, that's the way to find out is stimulate your body and then eat until it stops tasting good. So that looks like a lot, but is that enough for you? That's the question. And, um, yeah, the, the more stools is a bit is a bit strange. I mean, that does sort of suggest you're not absorbing things as much. Things with gristle, you're not going to absorb as much of the gristle. Um, eggs, you should absorb pretty damn easily. So if you just wanted to eat the hell out of some eggs, um, and that's what, what people used to do before there's a whole bunch of anabolic steroids and things like that, they would just take a bunch of eggs. It'd be like 36 eggs a day uh, would, would get um, a, a mild anabolic effect. Um, Vince Garanda, it's called the iron guru. He said that I think it was over 30 eggs a day for most men would be, um, uh, equivalent to a, a low dose anabolic, uh, steroid. Uh, so, you know, see how you go with that. Eggs are very easily absorbed. And so if you're not absorbing those, then you probably need to get that checked out, see what the hell's going on. Um, but, uh, yeah, just see what you can do. On, on that end and uh, yeah, good luck with it. Into intro spectrus, thank you for the super chat. Can carnivore help with uh, SIN1 and HPV58? Many women online claiming they cleared it naturally with plant-based diets and supplements. Hoping to avoid uh, let's uh, pure carnivore since January, uh, female 39, thank you. Well. You know, people can claim whatever the hell they want, but you know, the thing is, is that you know, if you go into any sort of clean diet, <laughs> and by that I mean, you know, just drop all the processed foods, sugar, alcohol, cakes, and candies, you know, you're going to improve. All of those things are plant based, right? So they were already plant based. They just cut out certain plants, and they just happen to throw the baby out with the bathwater and throw out the meat with it. So that's not to say that cutting out meat was the benefit. Cutting out the sugar and the processed crap that was the benefit. And, um, you know, and, and, you know, sin one, two, three go up and down, you know, all the time. And they, you have that, and there's, there's a certain percentage of, of sin three that will just resolve and go away and you won't, won't need any treatment. So, um, it just gets less likely, you know, the more advanced it gets. So, you know, it could just be that that just happened and, um, and it was a coincidence that they, they, they did that, or it could have been that it was helped by, uh, cutting out all the processed garbage, uh, on a carnivore diet, you will cut out the processed garbage and you will improve your mitochondrial function, which is the basis of, um, cellular dysfunction that can precipitate cancer. 
So HPV is going to be in your body forever. It's not going to go away, but your immune system can suppress it. And the damage that it does to the mitochondria that, cause, that can later precipitate cancer can be mitigated by the improvements that you put on your cellular health and the, and the, the stimulation of producing more mitochondria and replacing the old damaged, dirty, dysfunctional mitochondria. And so this is why ketogenic metabolic therapy um, has been shown in clinical trials to be extremely efficacious uh, in uh, cancers and treating cancers. And so, and presumably the prevention of cancers. And so that would be applicable here as well. And, um, and again, like, you know, what, what randomized controlled trials do we have or clinical trials or interventional trials do we have showing that plant-based diets, whatever that means, because Oreo cookies and heroin are plant-based McDonald's without the, without the meat patty is, is uh, plant. Well, McDonald's is plant-based. Um, and, um, you know, and, and without the bun, it's vegan basically, or without the burger, uh, the patty, it's vegan, basically one little patty and this burger fries and shake, you know, all of that is plant-based except that one little thin, measly, miserable piece of meat that they have in there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the meat's fault, I'm sure. So, uh, it could potentially help that. Um, I, there are plenty of people that have, that have, uh, reversed that. Um, but there are people that have, that have, it's just gone away anyway. So, you know, can we say that it's from one thing or the other? I would, you know, just knowing the biochemistry and knowing the biology and the cancer biology, I would say that, yes, it would help. Um, but I don't know of any studies that have shown that, but you can look up on PubMed or even Google Scholar. It's a pretty, pretty accessible resource. You can just look up, you know, uh, CIN and, um, and ketogenic diets. Someone has probably looked at that. There are thousands of studies on ketogenic diets and on multiple different um, health outcomes. So you can check that. You can also go on the Facebook groups, the larger, older Facebook groups like uh, Zero Carb Health and Zeroing In on Health. Those are on Facebook. And uh, you join those. You can go in the search function and you look up exactly that. You look up HPV, you look up SIN, uh, you know, 2, 1, 3, whatever. And there will be people that have spoken about it. I mean, there's tens of thousands of people in there from all over the world. And it's been going on for over a decade, well over a decade, some, like 20 years, some of these things. And so, you know, there's a lot of information there and there's a lot of, a lot of people's um, uh, accounts of what, uh, of, of what they've been able to accomplish. And so that's a really good resource as well. Jake, thank you for the super chat. Dr. Chafee, can you touch on male pattern baldness? What causes it? And if carnivore diet would help or make it worse? Well, there, there, I'm not an expert on that. Um, but I, I do understand that, that a lot of it can actually be driven by insulin resistance. You're getting high insulin levels over time. Insulin has a lot of roles to play in the body. It's, it has over a hundred different things that it does besides lowering blood sugar, right? So when you when you eat a bunch of carbs and your blood sugar goes up and your insulin goes up correspondingly, it's lowering the blood sugar, but it's also doing a hundred plus other things in your body out of balance. And so it can really mess you up. And so that was something that I've seen that um, insulin resistance um, can be can be implicated in, in, in that sort of thing. And so, you know, a lot of people when they go carnivore they get thicker nicer hair and um you know i, I know a lot of people that that did that um and you, you look at look at um a ted talk that jordan peterson did before he was jordan peterson um he was much more over he was overweight and he had very thinning hair and um he's a very different man now obviously and and that's when he went keto carnivore and now been carnivore for a long time and uh, big, thick hair and, uh, you know, very slender. So, you know, that's something that, that we do see a lot of people improve their, not only their hairline, but their hair thickness. Um, it, when the follicles die, they're dead, but they can be damaged to the point that they don't produce a hair anymore and can still be alive and still be salvageable. And so that's, that's, um, that's a potential. So, 
you know, the other side of things is, you know, is a DHT dihydrotestosterone, you know, uh, seems to damage certain hair follicles. Some are resistant, some are not. And so, uh, that's, that's sort of that, that thought of that, that, um, the, uh, the male pattern of that is that, you know, you have more dihydrotestosterone, you're going to kill those certain follicles in that certain area. But, you know, a lot of these things happen, they, they don't happen in a vacuum. You know, there's a lot of other things going on there. So that was something that <clears throat> Dr. Ken Berry said that it's like, basically, if you start going bald before 40, it's very likely to be due to insulin resistance and prediabetes and things like that, as opposed to uh, just your genetics. So something to think about anyway, uh, a lot of people do find that they get thicker hair. Some people have a fallout phase. And so they were like, oh my God, I'm losing my hair, but you're, you're not. As long as you're eating enough, eating enough fat and protein, um, you can trigger a fallout phase, but then it grows back and it grows back thicker. You know, my brother was, um, was, um, you know, it wasn't like going bald, but you know, it was a bit thinner. And then, um, after a few months on carnivore, it was like, he was just, it was like a teenager again. It was like, it was like hair model hair. It was like just out of nowhere. So, you know, the thing is, is that this, this can really, really turn things around for a lot of people and has, um, but it's not going to regrow dead hair. You know, like if those follicles are dead, that's they're dead. Um, and, um, so that's something to think about as well. So you obviously want to be healthy first. That doesn't mean that if you go carnivore, you're not going to go bald. There's other things that are going on there, but that's, that's at least one thing to remember is that it can actually be from high blood sugar, high insulin sort of things. And that can, that can cause damage. Patrice Tomas. Thank you so much for the super chat. Um, not seeing, not seeing a question, but maybe there's one down the chat, uh, down the line. Aiken, thank you for the super chat. Uh, it's a concern. Uh, Oscov wants us to eat even less meat. Who is advising the decision makers? It's bad news for general health. Probably the special interests, such as the the food and drug companies, who profit off of us being us eating their plant based crap and uh, then getting sick from it. And that's something that Cali Means has shown. You know, he's a whistleblower for uh, you know had, had previously worked in you know high level. Uh, aspect of, uh, you know, in executive level sort of um, roles and consultancies in uh, the big food and uh, drug companies. And he said that the food companies know that their food is making us sick, it's destroying our metabolism, our metabolic health, they're making us sicker. And I know, and then they're selling us a whole bunch of pills and things like that to keep us going along. He said, I know they know this because I was in the boardroom meetings with them while they spoke about it. So those are the people holding this, holding the the strings that control the politicians. And, um, you know, and they're, and they're, they have all these little dummy corporations and dummy charities that are all about children's health and pushing plant-based vegan crap in the schools, especially in Australia. I mean, there's their entire schools, um, entire schools that say it's plant-based. You can't send meat in with your child. It's like not sending my child to your school. That's what's going to happen. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty bad. And that's why we have to push back. That's why people in Australia and the U S and elsewhere, you need to write your politician. You just say, Hey, this is, this is important to me and this is bullshit. And, um, and we're not, we're not going to take this and we're not going to vote for you if you, uh, if you support this and that's all there is to it. And if enough people do that, they'll start paying attention, you know, because the, the, the first, second and third priorities that politicians have are re-election, re-election and re-election. That's all they care about. And so if you threaten that re-election, that is when they will listen to you. Never, you will never, ever catch them <laughs> listening to you otherwise. Um, if it's something that can help them in their career, then they'll then they'll back it. There are very few um, politicians that are actually there trying to help people. Very few. They exist, but it's it's very few. And the thing is, is that they're reelectable because people see that wow, this guy really cares, but uh, or or a woman really cares. But um, you know, all the other ones pretend to be that person. Oh, I really care. Oh, I care. Oh, I care so much. And we'll find out if they care. 
write to them and say, listen, this is a big issue for me. This has reversed my health issues. I've never been healthier. My mom's out of a nursing home and she's back living at home. And you know, I'm productive. I'm doing this. I'm able to pay taxes now instead of being a drain on society. You know, this is not only important for me, it's important for the country. Um, you know, you need to support this. You need to support, you know, people eating meat and not uh, driving out uh, the, the most healthy source of nutrition that has ever existed for humans. So, or any animals, um, you know, even herbivores eat, eat opportunistically eat other animals when they can, because it's perfect nutrition. They don't have to work for it. Um, it's very easy to turn uh, animal tissue into animal tissue. It's very difficult to turn plant tissue into plant into animal tissue. So, you know, I mean, this is, this is basic biology guys. You know, people that deny that are just denying reality or they just really don't know. They're just ignorant. They just don't, they don't understand basic principles in biology. Um, so yeah, you need to talk to your politician and you need to make noise. Yeah, the more noise we make, the more we're going to be listened to. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. You know, the hippies back in the 60s, they were like, oh, there's all these protests all over the country. It was the same damn people traveling around the country. It's the same people. It wasn't like, oh, everyone, oh, now California and now New York and now that. No, it was the same people just going around. They're just traveling around the country protesting. It was the same damn people. But it looked like a much bigger thing than it actually was. So squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? Um, and uh, so, you know, make noise and make your voice heard. You know, write your politician, phone in, write a letter, write emails. You get emails, they they get counted as, oh, this, this, this is how serious this is. You call in, it's more serious because you're taking more time. If you write a letter, that's that tends to be the most uh, the most you know, heavily weighted form of communication. Like if you actually take time to sit down and put pen to paper um, or type something up and send it in, no one does that anymore. You know, so they're going to think that you know this is this is actually more. You know, people, more people are going to worry about that. That's something I heard years ago. I don't know if that's true everywhere, but that's, that's what I've heard. So we just got to make, make our voices heard and just be like, Hey, no, I, I will not vote for you. If you don't, if you don't protect my, my interests here and um, enough people do that, they'll start paying attention because they'll start saying, Ooh, we really can't get away with this. If it's just a, if it's just a few flies on the wall who gives a shit. It doesn't matter if they get squashed. Um, and um, yeah, so that that's what you do. But that's where it's coming from is is uh, the people that are that profit from our illness. Okay, dealer Jason, thank you for the super chat. Uh, my friend has polycystic kidney disease with ten percent kidney function. Considering getting on transplant list, is it safe for her to try carnivore? And could it help fix your issues? Thanks. Yeah, well, as I mentioned before, higher protein diets improve kidney function and specifically polycystic uh, kidney disease and polycystic ovarian disease syndrome um, has been shown to improve on ketogenic diets. That's 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 recent research that's come out just within the last year. Um, and so, yes, I think it would help. Um, and it's certainly not going to hurt. It is certainly safe. Um, and I, I would hope that it would help. Hopefully it will get her kidney function back. Um, I've seen three people come off dialysis, which is nuts. That's not supposed to happen. And one, one gentleman that I'm working with now, he's vegan for a long time, destroyed his kidneys, destroyed his neuro, uh, neurological system, um, almost died. And, um, from years and years and years on a vegan diet, then raw food, vegan, then raw fruitarian. And, um, and, and then went, wow, my diet's killing me and went, <laughs> went flip to carnivore right then his body just <laughs> massive recovery. He's on dialysis, but he's making more urine. So that's very promising. That doesn't mean that he'll be able to recover enough. There's such a thing as damage done and may not be able to recover enough, but it's improving, which it's not supposed to do. Um, and so, uh, that's very promising. And so it's not going to hurt her. Um, if she ends up needing a transplant, it it's not going to be because she went carnivore. It's going to be in spite of the carnivore. And um, hopefully, knock on wood, that she she doesn't need that. And, uh, and this can help 
reverse that. Generally, with polycystic kidney disease, it's a, it's a, it's a one direction event. Um, so, you know, eventually she's going to need some serious overhaul on her kidneys anyway. And, um, you know, uh, this is at least something that is, is, you know, is possible that could help. And hopefully it does. And hopefully she doesn't need a uh, transplant as a result. Roman Tuimata, thank you for the super chat. Hey doc, I have a stage four DSRCT cancer. Watched your Seafried interview and want to try metabolic therapy. I can't find anyone doing it in New Zealand. Any suggestions? 300 days carnivore. Love your work, doc. Um, there is a neurologist in Hamilton named uh, Dr. Matthew Phillips. He's not an oncologist. And so he specifically works with like GBM cancers. Uh, but he does this and he's, and he's publishing works on it as well, specifically in GBM. It, it might be possible for you to get in touch with him and at least get get someone or or maybe he has contacts with someone who um on the in the oncology side of things that are that are uh, uh familiar with this and and willing to do it um so that's what I, that's what i would try um but you know this is something that you can do independently uh in conjunction with your normal oncologist you can just do this and you just keep your GKI down as low as possible. You try to keep it below two, below one if you can, uh, with combinations of carnivore diet and fasting. Um, and so really high fat, two to one uh, grams of fat to grams of protein. So you want 80% of your calories coming from fat. So like ground beef, you want 65% lean, 35% fat. That's two to one. Right. So really fat, as fat as you can get, add butter to that. And then you keep your ketones um, or your GKI down. So ketones up, blood sugar down. There's different ways of doing this. Most powerful ways are just eating that way. And then periods of fasting potentially. And you sort of just, just track that and you have to have periods of refeeds. You don't want to lose too much weight. You know, if you have extra weight on you, then, you know, you, you can have a bit of a cushion, but you don't want to keep losing weight, losing weight because that can, that can really hurt you as well. Um, those are the main tenants. And, um, you know, there are a few other caveats or sometimes medications and things like that, you know, help lower your blood sugar more. Um, you know, like, you know, metformin can, is sometimes prescribed for these sorts of things, but that those just help chemo and radiation as well. So even if you're going through standard of care, uh, this can make, make the chemo and radiation more effective and, and more safe for you. And it doesn't damage your body as much. So, um, good. I really good luck with that. You can try Dr. Phillips, uh, Dr. Matthew Phillips over in Hamilton. Um, but again, he's a neurologist and so he may not be able to help you, but he may at least know someone in, uh, uh, in oncology who can, and either way, you can you can do this yourself, um, and uh, you just keep your GKI down you, on average. And it doesn't have to be down all the time under two. It's just on average over the course of the week, you want that below two, right? And that's sort of a therapeutic range. You can also look into Paleo Medicina over in Hungary, and they may be able to do distance sort of. Um, uh, calls with you and uh, and help coach you with that. And they have a lot of experience with this. They've been doing this for like 15 years now. So, um, and they have very good results with with their cancer patients. So good luck with that. Hopefully you uh, you beat this and you you make it through with flying colors and and, um, and are able to, to, to get on the other side and, and help other people and inspire them to do it as well. Okay, just taking a look at this guys, I think I've got ton of um a ton of questions so i, I think we, we just cap it here i'm going to try to get through all these if, if i can but i'm actually flying out today <coughs> for a conference in um in uh sydney so um i'll be speaking at a conference this weekend and um and so i have to pack and get to the airport. So I, I sort of have about another half an hour and I'll try to get through as many of those as I can. So Terry, thank you for the super chat. 
Hi, I did a double take at the grocery store when I saw a familiar doc on a magazine. I bought it. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. That's very sweet of you to say that. Um, uh, yeah, so I was on the cover of, of Women's Health magazine, and um, they did a piece on carnivore, which was really cool. And so if people see that, you can you can support them or get that or or not. Uh, but um, yeah, it was, it was sort of fun. It was the um, first time I'd sort of been asked to do something like that, uh, which was nice. It was, uh, it was um, yeah, it was sort of out of the blue. I didn't, um, thankfully, I saw that email. I missed so many emails, but um, caught that one. And uh, yeah, and uh, so they sent a photographer over to the house and took some pictures and then did a phone interview and they wrote it up. So it was, it was kind of fun. So people can check that out if they're interested. I did a, a story about it with the, just the cover. Didn't have the insight on it. Um, but yeah, but people can check that out if they're interested. Thank you very much, Terry. I appreciate it. Prod LB, thank you for the super chat. Hey, Doc, at the rare uh, on the rare occasion that you drink alcohol, what do you drink? Thanks for converting me to carnivore and eternal health. Well, you're very welcome. I'm glad you, you know, were open-minded enough to give it a try. Uh, I mean, once every two years or so I might drink, uh, but then I regret it for the rest of the month because I don't get my energy levels back for a month. And um, so something has to be really you know, worth me, you know, not feeling my best for a month. Not that I feel hung over or anything like that. I just don't have good energy and, uh, and I don't feel my best. And I like feeling my best. Uh, but when I do drink, it would just be like pure spirits, like clear spirits, like um, vodka, you know, do like a, a vodka, you know, soda water. Like that's it. You know, no, no uh, mixers or anything like that. Just, just vodka and uh, water. Um, you know, you, you could potentially do things like whiskey, but they'll have more, you know, impurities in it. You know, that's what gives it the weird the brown colors. Just the little stuff from the oak is soaking in there and, and that gets in your body and uh, make you feel a bit worse. But um, yeah, that's what I drink, and then uh, and then I regret it for a month. But at least it's cleaner than all the other things. You're not getting all the other things. You're getting the alcohol, and that's bad. We know that that's a known poison. But at least you're not getting all the other unknown poisons, or at least um, little known poisons that that come along with it. So that's what I do. JB, thanks for the super chat. Female 65, lots of burping uh, for 10 minutes after 12 months carnivore, perfectly uh, or particularly when driving, just uh, beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. Was 35 years on antipsychotics, uh, zero for six months. Uh, please help. Um, well, first of all, congratulations getting off of the antipsychotics. That's amazing. You know, you've been off those for six months. That's, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I don't know what could be causing your burping. Um, I've seen that a couple other times. I, I, it generally just goes away if it's been sort of 12 months and you're still doing it. Is it because of the carnivore? Is it because of something else? Um, don't know. What you can do is you can get a, a diary, like a just a little food journal on um, and a symptom journal. And so you, you write down what you've eaten and how much you've eaten and... Um, and um, there's, um, yeah, so you, you, how much you've eaten, what you've eaten, when you've eaten it, and then whatever symptoms you get after that. It may be connected to certain things. Maybe there's certain foods, certain meats that don't you eat eggs and you're just burping after you eat eggs or something like that. And you just sort of see if there's any sort of pattern if it's, uh, or it, you can see that there is no pattern and it's completely unrelated to what you're eating, which is also good information. And then it's just like, all right, well, you know, at least it's not, something that I'm doing to myself is just something weird. Um, but that that's what I would do. Sometimes you can see those patterns and you can see uh, if something's triggering it. So Lena, thank you for the super chat. When you do one meal a day, do you stay full all day? Well, that's the only reason I would do one meal a day is if that were enough for me to eat that day or because I didn't have time to if I was you know working a lot and didn't have a chance. Uh, but I find if I'm eating fatty meat, um, you know, like ribeyes with butter on it, then I don't need, and I eat until it stops tasting good. Then I find that I generally don't need to eat more than once a day. If I'm just doing normal stuff, if I'm working out a lot and I'm regularly in the gym, that's twice a day. Uh, so I would need more. Uh, and if I need more, I need more. And I, if I need more, I eat more. 
And so, um, it's, uh, that's, that's why I would do it. So I don't, I don't fast and I don't do OMAD. I'm not, I'm only going to eat once a day. I, I tend to eat once a day just because that's how much my body needs. And I eat maximally during that one meal. And so when you do that, um, you know, you, you eating more high density food, you're eating, you don't need to eat as much or as often. And so it just naturally turns out that I end up eating about once a day. But if I'm hungrier than that, because I've been working out or much more active, then I, I eat more often than that. But uh, it's usually twice a day at most. Marshall Knight, thank you for the super chat. Um, 15 to 30 days. Uh, would a long fast 13 to uh, 15, oh, Jesus, 15 to 30 days help with loose skin? Uh, I would get a doctor to monitor weekly. I've lost 120 pounds. I live about 20 minutes from Dr. Ken Berry and was thinking of uh, trying to see him. Um, I don't. I don't know if he's seeing patients. He has. Uh, he. He. You know. He's been in practice for like twenty some years, and so he has um, other patients that he sort of keeps a track uh, track of. But he sort of does that uh, just as a as you know just just being nice. So I don't know if he, he takes on any new patients. But um, hey, buddy. But. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know for sure that it would, I mean, there are people that have, you know, lost a lot of weight, but done it, you know, with fasting and with, um, you know, carnivore and things like that and, and lost a lot of weight and their skin shrunk down with them. And, um, <laughs> and, um, you know, some people, some people, um, you know, will, will not get that tightening of the skin. So it's hard to say. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know you know, any, any sort of hard answers to tell you for that on, on whether it would or it wouldn't. Um, that's a long fast, you know, and, and if you're not, if you don't have cancer, I don't really recommend that for people. I don't really recommend fasting for, you know, people outside of, of a specific medical condition that it could help. Um, you generally get most of the benefits of fasting just from not eating the wrong things. If you're eating correctly, then you're going to be in the right metabolic state. Your body's going to work correctly as well. So you could try it. That's a long fast though. Um, and, um, you know, so you'd want to be careful and then you have, you have to do like refeeding, you know, slowly, you know, eating, introducing food again, but doing it in a very slow and careful way so you don't get sick. Um, but I can't really say one way or the other. And so if that's something you feel that is important for you to try, I would just, you know, you know, ask you to please be safe with it and be careful. I mean, we're, we're designed to weather famines and to not eat for a while and survive it. Um, but you still need to be careful. So just keep that in mind. Um, and if you were to try fasting, maybe start with shorter duration fast and see how that goes. Um, but, you know, just make sure you're healthy. Um, that's the most important thing. There are people that have done much longer fast than that and it, you can do it, but you just need to be careful about it. Okay. So just if you, you know, it's like you said, you know, check in with a doctor. Good. Uh, that's a good, a good first step, but you need to be very careful on refeeding and making sure that you're getting what you need to, to, um, I'm not a, a big expert in, in fasting because I'm not a big proponent of fasting. So I think you need to look into how to do it safely and, uh, and make sure you're not hurting yourself. But I, I don't know if it would help with that either way. So uh, it's up to you on whether you want to try that. AGK, thank you for the super chat. I feel satiated easily with beef. I'm tall and skinny and lose fat when I want to gain weight. Force feeding myself made me grossed out. How long until my body craves more meat for a caloric surplus? You know, so the thing is, is that you're not going to force that. You know, if you if you force yourself to eat, you'll just gain fat. You're not going to put on muscle. You might put on, you might make your muscles look a bit more plump because you put in glycogen and intramuscular fat called myosteatosis, um, which um, is, is something we see on MRI all the time. And um, so, 
you know, and that's just, you know, that's how, that's how you get marbling in uh, cattle. You feed them a bunch of carbs and they just put on a bunch of fat, right? But they put on fat in their muscles and that's how you get that marbling. So human marbling is, is it happens from the same thing. And that comes from, um, and it's called myosteatosis. So it's, um, you may look a bit bigger, but you're not actually gaining lean muscle mass. So what you need to do is you need to, to lift weights and you need to stimulate your body. You need to sprint, you need to work maximally, and then you need to eat until it stops tasting good. And you know where that is. You say you get grossed out. Yeah, that happens. Your body's telling you, stop eating. We don't need this. We don't want it. And so um, you need when you work out and when you lift weights, then you'll stimulate your body to grow. And when you do that, your body will need more food. And so you'll be able to eat a lot more. And in fact, you'll want to eat a lot more. And as long as you are and you get to that point where it stops tasting good, you don't have to be grossed out. You just have to keep eating as long as it tastes good. And you get to a, a bite that's just bland and not interesting. You go, hmm, I don't really want to eat anymore. That's what you need to do. Try that at least twice a day. But the workout is, is the main thing. So people have different body types and compositions. You're not just going to put on muscle for asking, right? You need to you need to put in the work, and um, and then you need to give your body enough food to to put on the muscle after that. Uh, and the idea of a, of a caloric surplus um, that you you have to force your body to take in more calories than it wants, and that's going to make you grow muscles is is bro science idiocy. You know, that's uh, like the way of uh, Stan Efferding and, and those clowns. He's a clown. I mean, like the guy is just has no freaking clue. But, you know, just saying, oh, you just have to force feed yourself all this sort of shit. That's how you put on fat. That's not how you put on muscle. So, you know, if you're eating what you're designed to eat and you're stimulating your body, you're going to put on muscle if you give your body enough food. If your body is screaming at you, don't eat, you moron. Um, you know, and you keep eating. You're not going to put on more muscle. Oh, okay, I guess I'll just, you know, I guess we'll just, you know, uh, put on muscle because you asked. No, if that's not how it works. That's gonna that's gonna turn into fat. And if you're eating a whole bunch of carbohydrates, it changes your metabolism. It, it spikes your insulin. It starts forcing intramuscular fat, intramuscular glycogen, which pulls in water, so you look bigger. Oh, look at look at me. I'm getting so bulky. And then you just stop doing that. It all goes away. And this is why these big mass monsters like like that clown. You know, bulk up and bulk up and bulk up, and then they lose like eighty pounds as they're shredding down for competition. That they did not lose eighty pounds of muscle; they lost eighty pounds of fat and water, you know, or however much they lose. And so, you know, it's uh, if you want to actually put on lean body mass and not have to lose fat afterwards, this is how you do it. So Nicholas uh, Varvarosis, Varvarisos, don't know how to pronounce your name. I'm sorry. But uh, thank you for the super chat question. Can you use a carnivore diet to reverse heart conditions as a result of partially blocked arteries? Like if you are high risk of heart attack, can you reverse this condition? Um, it's anecdotal at the moment. Uh, there are case reports of people doing that. There are uh, people that I've seen that have done that. Um, but we don't have like big studies showing that Ex I, I think the closest one would be the lean mass hyper responders data that came out with Dave Feldman and Nick Norwitz earlier this year that showed that people on a high fat meat based keto or carnivore diet and carnivore diet is a keto diet, uh, with this very elevated LDL, but also el well, it's elevated to them, um, you know, to other people perfectly fine and normal from my point of view, because that's physiological, it's what your body's supposed to do. Your body's doing it on purpose. Why the hell is that? Is that something that's, uh, if it's doing that normally physiologically, why would that be a problem? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Your body just has an inbuilt kill switch like that. You know, that, that species design would suck and it would not make it in the, in nature and they would just be extinct. So maybe that happens somewhere. They're not here anymore. Um, uh, that does not confer a survival advantage. So the person that got that that disease gene, um, they wouldn't do very well, you know, and they certainly wouldn't out survive the other people in their group. So in any case, um, the lean mass hyper responders, 
they had people on high fat meat based ketogenic diets with um, what they what was traditionally considered markedly elevated LDL. And they had no progression in their atherosclerosis. And in fact, the trend was to reverse atherosclerosis. And so we are seeing that. And so we're seeing those in, in those studies and uh, in that patient cohort. And um, and there are individuals that are coming out saying, hey, you know, I've opened up, you know, one one gentleman in my Patreon group, uh, Chip, he, he had 100% occlusion of his right carotid artery. Now it's patent. It's not completely open, but it's blood is passing through it now, right? It's just, you know, severely limited, but it's not 100% occluded. That's a massive improvement. They're not supposed to do that, but it recannulated, right? Like that's crazy. So, you know, it's, um, you know, the highway is not open yet, but the rock slide has been cleared enough for cars to go through, you know, so that's a big deal. That is a big, big deal. So I think that eventually the the data is going to show, yes, that this will do exactly that. But right now it's, it's very preliminary, but it's, it's not going to make it worse and it's going to help you in a thousand other ways as well. So even if it doesn't reverse that, um, you know, it's still worth doing. And then Sean O'Mara, Dr. Sean O'Mara has been showing that you can, that you're opening up vessels in the brain and elsewhere when you're getting rid of visceral fat and you get the fat around the, the heart as well. And he found that it's the areas of fat on the heart, this fat grows over the heart. And actually it's where that fat externally is touching the carotid arteries. Like that's where a lot of this pl plaque buildup uh, develops um, from something that he said, if I'm, if I'm not misremembering. Um, so that's interesting as well. I'm going to play chess buddy. Okay. He's going to start knocking on my chest pieces in a second, I'm sure. But uh, I, I would expect that this is something that that will be shown uh, to, <laughs> yeah, uh, there they go, um, to uh, be a thing in the future. But uh, again, the, the data is pretty preliminary at this point. Super fluidity of naughtiness. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Do you have any opinion concerning blood type diet? I'm O. And it recommends a lot of meat, but also specific veggies and fruit. Also, any thoughts on food uh, combining principles? So the thing is, is that it, it, you know, I'm, I'm type A, so I'm supposed to be a vegan, apparently. I'm supposed to be an herbivore uh, somehow, and uh, I am not. Um, and neither are you, and neither is any other human being on Earth. This, is, this doesn't go by blood type. This goes by species. And so the your blood type is is a is a one protein expression two protein expressions um and on on the surface of your of your red blood cells and not really anywhere else so why is it that that a protein or two difference on your red blood cells is going to completely overhaul your entire digestive tract and nutritional requirements why is it that someone with blood type a all of a sudden doesn't need b12 anymore do they just make their own now uh, because of their their blood type, no, that's obviously not the case. Um, the you know, lions have different blood types, parakeets have different blood types. They still have the same diet. So, regardless of the genetic idiosyncrasies or the blood types of any animal on Earth, they they eat they they eat according to their species, not according to their blood type. You know, you have you have people in a tribe, you know, uh, that. Uh, that are have have different blood types and then you have them eating what the tribe eats but all those babies have different blood types and so just some of them are dying off or something like that no that's not how that's not how that works and for mortality can be high but it's not because of their blood type uh, and and whether or not they're getting enough asparagus um so no that's that's really not a thing um the only the only thing you need to worry about with your genetics um, is, uh, are you human? If you're human, then you should eat what humans eat. You should eat a human specific diet. doesn't matter any of the, any of the, uh, my cat, sorry, uh, any of the, um, genetic differences between lions. You will, you can take every single lion on earth with all their little idiosyncrasies and all their genetic, um, you know, uh, uniqueness and, um, and you can put them all against, 
um, you can have them eat gazelle and you have them eat asparagus. And you will not find a single lion that does better on asparagus than it does on gazelle. Never. You'll never find that. Um, and the same thing goes with us. We still have an optimal diet. There may be some people that, according to their ethnic background, um, have uh, a, an easier time with inappropriate foods, like people that have had their their ancestors, you know, had agriculture for ten thousand years versus Native Americans, Native Australians who have only been exposed to this for a couple hundred years. Yeah, there's going to be a disparity there, um, in, in what they can eat, but they all do best on meat, right? My mom is type O, my dad is type A. We all got we're all AO, right? So. What does that mean? Oh, well, if you're type O, then you came from hunter gatherers. We all came from hunter gatherers. We all came from hunters. And, um, and my, my mom, who's, you know, European American, my dad, who's European American, um, type O and type A, they're just totally different human beings. And then, then we're, then what, what the hell are we? I have type A and type O. What the hell does that mean? I just need to eat Caesar salads for the rest of my life. No, it's, um, it's, it's not it's not the case that that matters it's um, you know one protein difference on your red blood cells is not going to make a difference um it matters what our species is our species is um human and our species is carnivore so that's what i would do how to fix dandruff uh, more fat less eggs no cheese yeah if you if you're reacting to something you know then that can potentially give you uh, dandruff or rashes or other sorts of symptoms. So you just get, get rid of that. Um, and, uh, more fat is good, but also, you know, we're putting on pretty harsh chemicals on our hair uh, and our head and that can dry it out and cause problems. Sometimes dandruff is, is from, uh, fungal, uh, issues that, you know, may, may just need to clear, or sometimes we're putting products in there that sort of looks flaky and weird. So, uh, but yeah, uh, but more fat is possible. And then getting rid of things that you might be reacting to is a good idea as well. Oh my goodness. Little boy, Jesus. He's, he's just systematically taking every chess piece and knocking them against the wall. And then he'll come back for another chess piece and start knocking it against the wall. Um, I may have to get him out of here. But, uh, uh, DC, thanks for the super chat. Uh, how can I get my teenage daughter to at least try this for 30 days? Um, I, I don't actually expect you to answer that. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you just, just slowly but surely try to ease her into it and um, and just just show by example and just show what you're doing. And, and sort of the, you know, with teenagers, especially, the more pressure you put, the uh, the, the more they're going to go away from it, you know. And um, thank you. And um and so, you know, that, that's, uh, that's a thing too. So if you just lead by example and you just show how good you're, you're feeling good, you're doing, and you just, you're just sort of dropping hints and all these sorts of things. And she sees that, you know, she's gonna, you know, she's gonna start to pay attention and hopefully, hopefully come around on her own. Uh, but if she thinks you're the one doing this, you may not, <laughs> may not, uh, go for it, but, um, you never know. It depends on, on your relationship with her, but, um, you know, I think, most most kids will come around when they see how well their parents are doing on it and how excited they get about it and you know they'll want to they'll want to copy them and they want to want to do that with them <coughs> portland 454 thank you for the super chat i'm a male in my late 50s what do you recommend to maintain testosterone and muscle mass in older adults exactly the same thing just uh, going on a carnivore diet i see this every day in my clinic um, people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s going on a carnivore diet and massively increasing their testosterone. Had a guy uh, in yesterday who uh, nearly doubled his testosterone as a 43-year-old male and uh, is now uh, making testosterone in, in the range that you would expect a healthy 25 year old. Okay. So he's, he's middle-aged and yet he's not, you know, because middle age is not middle-aged, um, sixties, middle-aged 70, 80, that's middle-aged. You know, we're supposed to live 120 years. 40 is still in the prime of life. So, uh, so is 50. And so, you know, you can absolutely, uh, 
build your testosterone by eating just a carnivore diet because you basically get rid of the, the barriers in the way of making proper testosterone. Um, and, and this is without any supplements or, or medications, by the way, he just doubled his, his testosterone. And I've had, you know, young men, a uh, young man, he was in, he's 19 or 20 and his, his testosterone was low for an 80 year old. And so it was, it was way, way below the chart, uh, for the reference range, which is already way too low. And he was below that. And so a normal doctor see that, go, Oh my God, you've got primary testicular failure. And like, you know, we need to go on testosterone replacement. You'll never produce uh, testosterone properly. Well, uh, we just put him on a carnivore diet and in two months of uh, not even being a hundred percent, he still had some cheats here and there. Um, he, he more than doubled his testosterone. And so he went from like 140, 150 up to like 380. And that was just in a couple months and it kept going up from there. And then he got really excited about that and started really dialing it in and becoming more serious about it and it improved more than that as well. Chronic cardio is, is not going to be your best friend. Um, stress and poor sleep are testosterone killers. So optimize those lift weights to fatigue, sprint to fatigue. Those both will, um, produce more testosterone and growth hormone and then carnivore diet. And that's how you improve your testosterone at any age. Jeff H. Thanks for the super chat. I've been carnivore for eight months following no calorie goal aside from eating till I felt full. I feel great, but I'm finding that as I lose weight, I'm eating more per day, not less. Is this common? Yeah. Think about it. You know, you're, you're, you have excess fat and your body's prioritizing that and using that. That's why it's going away. Right. And so by the time you get down to a, a more stable body fat percentage, you have to eat more in order to maintain your weight and, and the, the body fat percentage, because your body wants you at a certain body fat percentage. And so you're going to need more to sort of maintain that. I, I, it was literally overnight for me. I was eating one big ribeye a day and that was perfect for me. And then one day I was just like, oh, no, I need more than that. And I was eating two and it was then <laughs> two from then on, uh, of that size. Now I just do much thicker, uh, steaks. And so that that's enough for me. Um, but I got down to, you know, like a low body fat percentage is, you know, on, on calipers. So however accurate those are, um, it was like, you know, five, 6% body fat. And that was it. Nope. Nobody was like, Nope, that's where we're staying. And you need to get, um, you need to, to get more food now. And it just doubled overnight. So that, that is very normal. Um, that, uh, you know, and, and, and it makes sense, isn't it? You know, you're losing weight, you're losing body fat. And then when you get, oh, and when you get those body fat stores down to where your body says, no, this is the rainy day fund, that's when your, your appetite will increase. So yeah, that's totally normal. So keep doing it. You're doing it exactly right. Just eat until it, not necessarily until you feel full, but until it stops tasting good because feeling full is very different because it's, uh, you know, our, our hunger signals are very different. You have to relearn that and it goes by taste. Keep eating fatty meat until it stops tasting good. That's the key. Bishop's deep learning. Thanks for the super chat. Uh, can you expand on the nutrients found in fat? Uh, also does fat from different parts of the animals have better nutrients, e.g. Eskimo considered the brain and fat from behind the eyes, a delicacy, uh, creepy. So, um, uh, yeah. So, I mean, the brain obviously has a lot of, of extremely important nutrients in it as well that are important for your brain. And, um, and that's something we've been eating for millions of years There's evidence. We need pound stones to crack open the skulls of carrying animals and, and get at the brain. And that was something we could access because we weren't, you know, we were scavenging a lot of the meat that we were eating for, for a long time before we were able to actually hunt and get sharp stone tools to cut off meat and eat it. Um, but uh, there, there's quite a lot. I mean, there's there's more than we understand as well. There's a study that came out that said there was estimated about 51,000 uh, nutrients, potentially essential nutrients in meat that we, we don't even necessarily have names for all of these things. And so, um, you know, a lot of those would be in the fats, but you know, you get all the, the, the essential fatty acids, cholesterols, 
uh, uh, really important as well. But DHA, EPA, um, the the other sort of saturated fats and unsaturated fats that are important for your body coming from animal fats and um, vitamin D3, vitamin A, vitamin E, K2, all of these things are, are fat soluble and uh, and exists in the fat and so those are those are things you need so those are sort of some of the main ones but there's there's so many and we don't even necessarily have names for all of these things so it's not even enough to just supplement um you know certain things like yes you have a deficiency in d and you're not really getting enough from from for whatever reason sure you know you want to take some fine or b12 especially but um as far as the different sorts of organs certainly the different organs are going to have a different a nutrient content like the uh like the brain is going to have a different nutritional uh uh composition than just your normal fat around your body um fat behind the eyes who knows potentially you know people go would would prioritize the cheeks and the tongues of animals those were always the delicacy the high fat content very very tender very flavorful um that flavor that more flavor is probably indicating more nutrients and so that's probably why that is so yeah there would be a difference just like the different organs taste very different as well and um and uh yeah so those are some, some broad strokes anyway but uh you know if you have if you have a certain part of that animal that you really enjoy and that tastes really good to you your, your prob body's probably talking to you and telling you like hey you want some nutrients that uh that this little particular Part of the animal has that's why sometimes liver tastes really good and then you eat a few of it and you just go nope don't want any more that's uh that's probably your body saying we have enough of those nutrients now so this is it's from my sister rosalind new t-shirt idea plants killed socrates actually i'll probably end up making that that's that's a great idea um uh because they did the bastards so yeah that's great idea thank you for that rosalind <laughs> Um, Emily, thank you for the super chat. I've been having mild gallbladder pain, uh, the last week I'm 22 on carnivore. Uh, I eat three meals a day till full with small snacks in between when hungry, any suggestions on why and what to try? Well, you know, I mean, the first question I ask is, is, is it actually your gallbladder that's paining you? That's, um, you know, you get that sort of in the, in the right upper quadrant, just under the, the ribs there. If you eat fatty meat and all of a sudden it's squeezing and it might be on some stones or sludge and it's pushing on those things and that's uncomfortable. And, um, and so that would happen when you're expressing bile, when you're eating, eating uh, fat. And so first of all, it's important to, to, to know if that's actually what's going on or if it's something else. Um, so it's specifically in the right side under the ribs when you eat fat. And um, so, you know, that's the first question to answer. Um, if it if if it does turn out to be that that's what's going on, and you have stones or you have sludge, um, this can potentially clear if those stones are small enough and they can they can pass out. If you have stones that are that are too big and they get stuck, then you you will need a procedure. You'll need help to get that that stone pulled out of there. You may end up losing your gallbladder. The thing is, is that bile store is stored in the gallbladder and concentrates there because we have to deal with famines and not getting enough food all the time and so it has to be concentrated so you can get a big amount of fat you know at a certain point or when you're able to eat as opposed to you know eating every single day and all the time every day like a grazing animal and um so if you're doing uh, a carnivore diet and you're eating a lot of fat you know that's going to start stimulating that and you're going to start moving that uh, and if you have those stones in there, it's going to start, uh, you know, it can be a bit uncomfortable. But the reason that you have those in the first place is because you weren't eating enough fat before because your gallbladder is going to store that bile and it's going to just sit there and sit there and get concentrated and concentrated and it's going to form crystals. It's going to form precipitate. That's what hyper-concentrated solutions do at rest is they turn into crystals, they solidify, right? And so that's what bile sludge is. That's what gallstones are. And so... You, they say, oh, don't eat fat. You're going to get it. You, you know, it's going to hurt. Okay. Well, it might hurt, but what it's doing is, is clearing those things and it's dissolving that and, and not making more concentrated. If you avoid fat, 
then it's going to get worse. Those stones are going to get bigger and you will get an obstruction and they will get blocked and you will have to get your gallbladder removed. So the trick is to eat enough fat. Hopefully this clears, you know, if you do it, you know, slowly and, and, um, carefully, then hopefully it won't be too uncomfortable. But, um, first of all, maybe talk to your doctor and, and get a, like an ultrasound of the, of the gallbladder just to see what's going on. Make sure it actually is, that's what it is. But either way, I, I would still do the same thing, which is eating high fat carnivore diet. And that will potentially dissolve those or clear those and, and have you pass those through and get those out of the gallbladder. You could get an obstruction. You may have to end up getting a procedure like an ERCP where it you know, goes in through the mouth and snakes up in there and pulls that little stone out of the, the common bile duct. If, if it's, possible to do so. Um, but if it's not possible to do so, and they have to take out your gallbladder, then that'll be unfortunate, but that's sort of the horses out of the barn at that point anyway, because it was, it was a foregone conclusion at that point, because if you, um, if you don't eat fat, then it's only going to get worse. And there, you're definitely going to get a blockage and obstruction at some point anyway. So might as well just sort it out now, but hopefully that doesn't happen. Hopefully your body clears it. Kevin Pateg, thank you very much for the super chat. Last two weeks or so on carnivore, I'm experiencing um, really vivid dreams, so vivid that real life experiences through the, the, the day seem to continue on in my sleep. Interesting. Is this related to a new way of eating? Uh, potentially. I mean, um, I, I heard, I have no idea where this came from. It was just something my mom told me when I was a kid was that, um, is that if you had higher B vitamins, you'd get more vivid dreams. And, um, and I tried that as a kid because I was like, Oh, that's interesting. And, um, and you might have lucid dreams where you actually realize you're dreaming in your dream. And then all of a sudden you're like, Ooh, I'm in my dream. I can just do whatever I want in my imagination. Instant superpowers. I think everybody just starts flying and doing other sort of crazy stuff. When I did this, um, it, that was always the thing. I, I basically turned into a, a jet, a flying Jedi. Um, I would just like instantly start flying and then shooting like lightning bolts out of my hands, like the the Emperor Palpatine, and um, and like materialize a massive diamond and like a, a chick there because I was a teen, <laughs> I was a teenage boy. But um, uh, you know that that could very well be uh, because of uh, uh, B vitamins. Um, and you're actually getting proper B vitamins now. So I, I don't know, but that's uh, something that I was told as a kid anyway. And uh, when I took B vitamins before I would go to sleep, I would always have very vivid dreams and even lucid dreams, especially when I was tuning up for it. Cold Brew, thank you for the super chat. Uh, I'm tired of ground beef. Steaks are expensive. Can I eat chicken thighs and eggs? Uh, yes, you can. I heard that uh, beef is more has more nutrients and is the best uh, meat to eat. Do you need to take any carnivore supplements? Generally, not. You know, you can you could probably live your whole life on eggs, uh, pasture raised eggs. Though I mean, those pasture raised eggs have far more nutrients in it than than the normal corn fed eggs that we're we're going to get corn and soy fed eggs. So you know that's what you want. You want to get you want to get um, uh, the highest quality chickens and eggs and things like that, that you can. And, um, and so you're getting pasture raised eggs. If you raise your own chickens and you get your own eggs, that's going to be even better. Just let them eat bugs and worms and things like that and forage around. That's where you're going to get, that's where they get nutrition. That's where you're going to get the nutrition as uh, by proxy. And, um, so that that's, but yeah, you can absolutely do that. Um, I've, I've spoken to people who, um, uh, who have, you know, have met people that have lived years and years. There's a, there's a story of a guy, uh, in, uh, who was traveling in Germany and he saw this guy and he was in his eighties, but he, he just got done cycling and he was just, you know, he, he, you could tell he was a bit older, but he, he had the physique of like a, you know, someone in their thirties. And, um, and so he, uh, he sort of just asked him, he was, got talking to him and he just said, you know, that he had been in world war two. And he was, uh, you know, obviously he's German, so he was fighting for the Germans. And um, he got injured early on in the war, so he was sent back home. Inflation was just out of control. And so he just, as, as soon as he was able to with his, you know, the money he had from 
from the army, he uh, just bought a little place up in the hills somewhere and bought some chickens because he couldn't really afford food. And so he just lived on the chickens. He would never eat the chickens just because they fed him. And so, you know, they lived together nicely. And then he got more chickens and they laid eggs and they had more chickens. And they laid eggs. And pretty soon he was able to eat very comfortably and, and, um, and, and feed his neighbors and give them eggs and all that sort of stuff. And he said that he just kept doing that throughout the war. And then he just felt so good that he just never stopped. And so he'd been eating just eggs, his own pasture raised eggs for 60, 70 years at that point, or 60 years at that point, I'd say. And, um, and, uh, you know, it was doing great, it was really healthy. So you could do it. You just need to hire nutrition, uh, pasture raised eggs and, um, you know, tons of folate in pasture raised eggs, uh, tons of everything. You know, these are the precursors for life is all the nutrients that are in an egg. And, um, you can always just check. You know, if you're not, if you don't think you're, or if you want to know how much nutrients and vitamins and minerals you have, you just check. And if you're low on something, you can supplement that or make sure you're getting higher quality eggs. Chilled monkey brains. Uh, thank you for the super chat. So I've heard you mention an association between diet and autism spectrum disorder. Can you elaborate? Are there any studies I can take a look at? Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I've put a number of studies in um, the the uh, videos that I've done on autism. And um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of associations and you know, associations isn't, isn't causation, but at least it's interesting. Uh, there's one that had preconception diets, so women that were eating a lot more meat and red meat preconception, so before they got pregnant, had much lower rates of children with autism. Presumably, they're not just gonna stop doing that during pregnancy and, and rearing of the child. Um, so, you know, who knows? um, about that, but they specifically were talking about preconception, um, women that have higher LDL cholesterol and total cholesterol during pregnancy, lower rates of children with autism that eats higher saturated fat diets during pregnancy, lower rates of kids with autism, women who breastfeed instead of bottle feed, lower rates of kids with autism. Um, does you know, people that now this one, I was looking specifically for formula fed, versus bottle versus breastfed. And I couldn't find a study on that, but the bottle fed was the closest one I could get. I was wondering, you know, is sugar going to be a precipitative factor um, for uh, autism because uh, formula fed uh, formulas have just a buttload of sugar added to it, um, which is not good, uh, I think. And, um, and a bunch of seed oils and horrible, nasty crap like that. So this didn't differentiate between people that just express milk and put that in a bottle and use that as well as formula. But, you know, most people who bottle feed instead of breastfeed are using formula um, because usually people that, that breast pump, they're also breastfeeding and then they pump as well. And they're sometimes having a bottle. The ones that exclusively bottle feed, they're not breastfeeding at all and they're not pumping at all. And so they're not making milk at all. Um, and so it's much more likely that the, those people were using formula. And so the, so that group anyway, had higher rates of kids with autism and then the out of university or the Texas A&M university in America, they found that vegans and vegetarians were having higher rates of kids with autism. And, and that is in the literature as well as higher rates of, uh, autism in uh, vegan and vegetarian families that eat less meat or no meat. And. Texas A&M found that one of those was uh, seemed to be causative because um, of a carnitine deficiency. And so people that don't have enough carnitine, their brains don't develop properly, their neurons can't develop properly. And, uh, and this is important for mitochondrial function and health as well. And so it's, um, they found that, uh, well, it is the case that carnitine is actually an essential nutrient for a lot of people fully 30% of people don't make enough carnitine or any carnitine at all. And so it's all, oh, well, it's, it's non essential. It doesn't matter. Bullshit. It matters for at least 30% of people and more in your diet is helpful as well. And so they found that, that people, vegans and vegetarians, they weren't getting enough carnitine for their kids. And if their kids weren't making enough carnitine, if they were one of these fully one third of humanity that uh, doesn't make enough carnitine, that they were that they were uh, getting these types of autism where the brain wasn't developing properly. And then you have studies of of 
uh, you know, all, all throughout the literature showing that ketogenic diets in particular, getting rid of carbs and sugar changes the brain energy and changes the mitochondrial function and patterns in the brain uh, of autistic um, children and adults and their brain starts working better. And so there are entire treatment groups, there are, entire, there are doctors and facilities that treat autism with ketogenic diets. Professor Chris Palmer from Harvard, a professor of psychiatry at Harvard, wrote about this in his uh, book, Brain Energy. And we talked about it on our interview um, that, that I did with him. If you will look for that on our channel. We talked a lot about autism. And, uh, and he was saying that, that going on ketogenic diets is really important for uh, autistic kids, especially because you have a chance to reverse a lot of the misdevelopment of the brain and develop properly and uh and more healthfully than um uh, as a kid when your brain is still developing and so that's when you need to get this but even as adults i've spoken to many adults with autism who have significantly improved their lives and their symptoms one guy um uh, jonathan griffiths who we've done a couple podcasts together really nice guy he's, he's a british guy who uh is a, is a bodybuilder and um and we, you know, the subject of autism came up and he said that he had autism. You would never have guessed this by speaking to him, by, by the, the rest of the conversation. I had no idea that he uh, was on the spectrum, but he said that a year ago before he was doing carnivore, he would not have been able to have the conversation we were having right now, which is amazing. And I've had uh, people come to me and say, they, you know, come up to a conference. There's a lady I did a, uh, a podcast with, uh, Allie. She goes by Allie Carnivore. We did a podcast together on autism and, and her story with her kid. She, I had, you know, I'd spoken to her online before and she came up to me at KetoCon um, two years ago. And she said, um, you know, this is my son, this is my, these are my kids. And, you know, said, did all the hellos. And she said, he's a nonverbal autistic. And I was a bit confused. I was like, I'm pretty sure I just heard him talk. And then she said, when eating carbohydrates. And so when he doesn't eat carbohydrates, he is completely functional. And then he'll go over to his grandparents' house and they'll, you know, try to buy his love with candies and cookies and things like that. And, and he'll come back and he won't speak for four days. Right. And, um, and so that just shuts down his brain. His brain needs ketones. And so then it goes back into ketosis and all of a sudden his brain works again. And so they got him on carnivore for probably close to two years now. And six months ago or so, she told me that she messaged me and said that he tested into the gifted program at school. So he went from being a nonverbal autistic, and that could have been the rest of his life, to now being in the gifted program and actually being able to be functional and, and, a, and a, a productive a uh, successful adult. I and mean, that's a, that's an amazing, amazing difference you can do for somebody. And it's just from not eating carbohydrates. And I get comments all the time. You know, if people here are suffering with autism or have a family member suffering with autism, please put that in the comments, put that in the chat. Uh, and definitely in the comments because they're more permanent. Uh, tell your story. What's, what's your, what's your um, experience with this? Because it's important for people to get this out there and know it because if they have a family member and they're just kind of like, well, it's hard. It's hard to change people's diets, especially when they're autistic. You know, it's difficult, but oh my God, it's worth it. And so the more this gets out there and more people realize just how worth it this is, you can completely change this person's course of their entire life for the better you know, that it's so important. And however the hell you can do it by hook or crook, you know, it's so important to do. Um, I, I've spoken to adults that are autistic and suffer with autism their whole life and, um, and said that, uh, you know, that when they eat carbs, they turn nonverbal and they can't speak for days and they just shut off. One person was actually really sad. We were talking about autism. I, I had a short talking about autism. And uh, you look at the comments, it's, it's a recent short. So go into my shorts and go uh, to the, the one on autism. Look at the comments. There's a lot of comments on there, people with autism, a family member with autism, and, uh, and these massive improvements. One was, was, was kind of sad, but they said, imagine being in a world of your own design in your own head for years, for your whole life, and then one day deciding to eat meat 
And then all of a sudden coming out of it, and now you're in a completely different world. And you realize the world that you were in before wasn't the real world. But now you have no skills. You have no family connect. You have no friend connections. You have no this. You have no that. And you're in this new world that's now completely foreign to you. And you don't have any skills and life skills and things like that. Um, I don't have to, I don't have to wonder what that's like because I, that's my experience. So that's some, what they were describing and you go on in the chat and people were talking about this and other people had that experience too, was that they had autism and their, their brain was not working right. And then all of a sudden they started eating meat and it started getting better as an adult, getting healthier and healthier and healthier. And all of a sudden they're there and they know what's going on now and their brain's working to an extent that you know they they see the world around them for what it is and they realize shit i'm 40 years old and i don't have any job skills or life skills and that's hard so the earlier you do this the better however there are a lot of, like jonathan that that are adults that have you know had uh, autism and um and and completely changed it and now you know he's he's just living a normal functional productive life which is great so it, it makes a massive difference. It makes a massive, massive, massive difference. So anybody with uh, you know, that, that has this sort of condition or has a family member with it, please give this a try. This is something that can completely change your life and it can change their life. And it's something that um, is probably the most important thing that anyone with autism can do. Okay, I'm going to do just a, a couple more questions, guys. Um, and um, okay, I'm just going to, I actually sort of want to just end it on that note because that was sort of a good note to end it on. Um, and I've sort of gone about half hour over where I thought I was. Um, thank you very much, everyone. I, I, I think I probably do just want to leave it there on that, that note about autism, because I think that's a really important message. Um, please, if anybody has or knows someone that suffers from autism, you know, please do try to get resources to them or their parents, or if you're the parent, you know, think about this seriously, um, and, and look at the research and, uh, and see if you can do it. For your child or yourself because it, it makes a massive difference and the sooner you do it the the sooner that they can recover and the sooner that they can can rebuild their life and um and just be a happy healthy uh wonderful uh person that doesn't have to get um you know that doesn't have to suffer with with their brain not working the way it's supposed to um so yeah we'll end it there thank you all very much it's been an absolute pleasure I love the questions. They're always they're always interesting and always great, um, and um, and uh, you know it's it's always it's always interesting to see what the the questions are going to be. And it's always you know, you'd think that it would be pretty pretty much the same questions of just eat meat, do this. You know, it's like, but it's not. I mean, there's similar one. You know, cholesterol gets brought up a lot, but um, that's understandable. But uh, yeah. It's um, always great questions, and I really appreciate you guys coming on. Hope you like this. If you do, please uh, hit like and think about subscribing if you haven't, and leave a comment below and let YouTube and other people know what you think, and uh, and especially if you or someone you know um, suffers with autism, please do let us know what your experiences have been with yourself or with your family member, or loved one, or friend, just because my God, I mean, if we can just reverse this um, and nothing else, I think that would be a huge, huge impact and benefit to humanity. So, all right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, really great to see you. I'm, I'll am i be doing a um, another premiere on Sunday U.S. time, Monday morning, um, Perth time, as usual. And then I'm thinking of adding in a second uh, YouTube live thing a week just because of, um, you know, I don't always have as much time to, to get through all the questions. So I might add in a second one during the week, possibly on Tuesdays in the US, Wednesday mornings in Perth. So that would be Tuesday, Thursday, or Wednesday, Friday, depending on what part of the world you're in. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate it. And uh, have a great weekend.